Hello and thank you for joining us for this Our Aberdeen online session today when we are connecting to our collections through a virtual journey up Royal Deeside. Welcome all aboard the Royal Deeside tour. We've packed our tourist guide, our picnic blanket and of course the important flask and fine piece for the fly cup and we're ready to take a journey up Royal Deeside looking at some of our wonderful artworks and objects from the Aberdeen Archives Gallery and Museum's collections along the way. The cutting of the first piece of turf to mark the start of the construction of the railway took place at the estate of Alex Kinloch of Park, close to Drum. The ceremony was on the 5th of July, 1852, described by the Aberdeen Journal, from which I will quote, a raised platform was constructed under a large marquee, gaily decorated with flags and evergreens for the accommodation of directors and guests. Seats were provided in a large enclosure for the vast number of spectators present. The spot which was due to be cut was marked in front of the platform and a tasteful mahogany wheelbarrow and a steel spade bearing the arms of Mr Kingloch stood in readiness for the fair lady of the manor. Wine and cake had been provided by the directors and were widely distributed. Even the weather was on its best behaviour. The ceremony began at 1pm and after the opening speeches from Mrs Kinloch, in the most graceful manner, cut a pretty large sod and placed it neatly on the wheelbarrow. Loud cheers followed, then two stalwart navvies stepped forward to fill the other barrows, for the dignitaries to wheel away with much good humour. A poem to mark the occasion was printed in the newspaper. Here are three of the many verses. Come south, come north, come east, come west, humble garb or gaily dressed, but come with smiles and wishes best to cheer our Reeside Railway. You bankry lads and lasses ah, you will me glad a loud hurrah, for you'll quickly get the things that's bra by a trip on the Deeside Railway. Aberdonians young and old, You'll not get trips in search of gold, but you'll get what can't be bought nor sold by a trip on the Deeside Railway. Only 14 months later, the railway opened on the 7th of September 1853 from Aberdeen to Bankrey. The Aboyne extension opened in December 1859 with the Ballater extension following in October 1866. The original proposal was to reach Bemar, but Queen Victoria objected to this, fearing invasion of her family privacy and disturbance to the estate. By law, houses built nearby had to face the railway, as Queen Victoria did not want to see folks washing hanging in the back gardens. Royal trains took 75 minutes to travel the 42 and a half miles to Ballater. That's around 34 miles per hour. Queen Victoria obviously didn't want the speed. Passenger services were withdrawn on 18th of July 1966, with the line closed completely by January 1967. So, on to our first stop on the journey. Our first stop along Royal Deeside Trail is Finnan. We're stopping off here as it was the home of the famous painter, Joseph Farkerson. Joseph Farker's family were landed gentry who occupied the lands of Finnan since the 16th century. Young Joseph was educated in Edinburgh and permitted by his father to paint on Saturdays. At aged only 13, he exhibited his first painting at the Royal Scottish Academy. Farkerson made his reputation painting winter scenes and he had nicknames such as Frozen Mutton Farkerson and the painting Laird. Here we have a self-portrait that he painted in 1882. He's sporting a tam o shanter worn at a jaunty angle, portraying himself as an archetypal Scot. On the right we have his painting Afterglow, which was painted in the Forest of Burse, part of the Finnan estate. It is an oil on canvas painted in 1912 and stands around five feet high and three and a half five feet wide. Farkerson's winter scenes bathed in the warm light of sunrise and sunset were incredibly popular in the Victorian era. Normally, in a Farkerson painting, there would be no people at all, just animals. But in Afterglow, you can see the evidence of a person by the footprints left in the snow. There is also a curious rabbit who has decided it's safe to come out into the open. 
A dayside winter can be quite harsh, so he had wooden huts made which were on wheels, with a window at the front and a working stove, to keep him warm while working outside. As for the problem of constantly moving animals, he avoided this by making a number of stuffed sheep, and he placed them in the landscape to create the best compositions for his paintings. Here we have a close-up of Afterglow, and it goes very nicely with the reading by Nan Shepherd, who was a native of cults and a lecturer at Aberdeen College of Education. She was a writer and poet most famous for her mountain memoir, The Living Mountain, based on her experiences of walking in the Cairngorms. Here is an extract which could well describe the scene in Afterglow. How crisp, how bright a world, but except for the crunch of our own boots on the snow, now silent. There was not an empty world, for everywhere in the snow were tracks of birds and animals. The animals had fared as we did. Sometimes we stepped buoyantly over the surface of the drifts. Sometimes we sank in well above the knees. Sometimes the tracks were deep holes in the snow, impossible to read, except for the pattern in which they were placed. Sometimes the mark of the pad was clear, just sunk into the snow surface. And at other times, only four or five space pricks showed where the claws had pierced. We might be feeling a wee bit chilly after all that snow, so let's warm up by moving on to the next part of the journey. Our second stop is a Boyne, and near a Boyne is Balnacraig, where Donald Dinney was born. Donald Dinney was born in 1837 and died in 1916. He was a Scottish strongman born in Balnacraig, Burse, near a Boyne. Often described as Scotland's greatest athlete, Dinney maintained an unbroken reign as Scottish Highland Games champion from 1856 until 1876 and he was famous the world over. He turned professional athlete and toured the world at the age of 30, winning over 11,000 competitions. He received one pound for winning his first event at age 16, and throughout his career he won a total of 28,000 pounds in prize money. This equates to approximately 2.5 million today. Dinny held the title of world champion wrestler and was regarded as the strong man of the age. During World War I, heavy artillery shells were nicknamed Donald Dinnies, and in his later years he endorsed the soft drink Iron Brew. Despite his famous success, Donald Dinney died in 1916 at the age of 79 in poverty. The photograph on the left is of Donald Dinney at age 40 and is part of our Aberdeen Greats treasure box at Aberdeen Treasure Hub in Northfield. The granite putting stone in the centre was used by Donald Dinney, and it's around 16 centimetres. It weighs 7.5 kilograms and is made from Aberdeen granite. So a pretty heavy object to throw at the distances that he did. On the right is a presentation figure of Donald Dinney, made by Gerard Robinson in 1870. It is made of pine and metal and is around 58 centimetres tall. The carved pine sculpture depicts Donald Dinney dressed in a kilt and sporran and wearing a sash decorated with gilt embellished medallions. We have lots of Donald Dinney's medals in our collection, so here are just a couple of the many he was awarded throughout his lifetime. The one on the left is a silver medal with a corded edge and broad surround engraved on one side with flowers. The medal is also engraved with an inscription, which reads Champion Medal Awarded to the Most Successful Athlete at Ballater, 1868. The one on the right is a silver medal with a decorative wreath border. It is engraved with an inscription for throwing the hammer 27 pounds, 84 feet and 10 inches, 1865 Braemar Highland Society. Donald Dinney made the Highland Games famous across the world and the Balmoral Estate was made famous by Queen Victoria 
and it is still a favourite holiday destination for the royal family today. Located near Crathy in Deeside, Balmoral Castle is one of two private residences owned by the royal family, unlike the royal palaces that belong to the crown. Our first artwork inspired by this beautiful part of Royal Deeside is called Balmoral Castle by James Cassie and painted somewhere between 1850 and 1874. It is painted in oil and canvas and stands around two feet high and three feet wide. James Cassie was born at Keith Hall near Inverurie, the son of a prosperous tea and spirit merchant. Although briefly a pupil of the artist James Giles, Cassie was largely self-taught. He began his career as a painter of animals and portraits, but on moving to Aberdeen, he increasingly turned his attention to local seascapes and coastal scenes, especially at dawn and sunset. He favoured these outdoor scenes, but continued to paint some domestic subjects and portraits throughout his life. In 1869, he moved to Edinburgh and was elected an associate of the Royal Scottish Academy. You can find out more about Balmoral Castle and other residences on the Royal website. We'll put a link below this video. So let's have a look at Queen Victoria herself. We have thousands of photographs in our collection from the Victorian era. This photograph is of Queen Victoria mounted on her horse Fivey, with John Brown holding the bridle. The person on the right is a man called John Grant. This is probably the most successful commercial photograph published by the photographer George Washington Wilson. Next to the photograph we have John Brown's hip flask. This glass spirit flask is bound with leather with a silver top and base engraved with a monogram. The close friendship of John Brown and Queen Victoria was depicted in the 1997 film Mrs Brown, starring Judi Dench and Billy Connolly. Another popular artwork of this era is one that we're going to take a look at next. Sir Edwin Landseer was one of the most popular of the Romantic painters, working in Britain during the first half of the 19th century. He took a cottage deep in the highlands at Glenfeshie, and when Queen Victoria and Prince Albert leased Balmoral as royal residence, Landseer became a frequent visitor, instructing the young queen in drawing and etching. Landseer's paintings told stories containing pathos and homely sentiment. This painting was inspired by a real incident. A sudden flash flood that devastated the valleys at the foot of the Cairngorms and the Mauna Lea Mountains on the 3rd and 4th of August in 1829. Landseer has piled incident upon incident in a pyramidal arrangement to convey the mounting terror and confusion of the villagers as the water rises beneath them. The painting has been described as a highland version of Noah's Ark. You can hear more about this artwork by using the link below this video. Now on to our final stop of the journey. Braemar is a popular tourist destination and loved by locals and visitors alike. The sound of waterfalls can be heard at the Garvalt, meaning rough burn, in the Balakbury forest near Braemar. Here we see the upper falls of Garvalt, with a beautiful iron bridge with two figures and the falls in the background. Again, this was taken by George Washington Wilson and is a beautiful example of 19th century photography. After all that nature and outdoor gambling, it's time for a wee bit of a hoolie at the Braemar Gathering. Here we see a Braemar Highland Games watercolour made in 1898 by Aberdonian John Mitchell. Folk love to get a wee bit dressed up for the festive Highland Games. And here we have some wonderful examples from our costume collection. We have a rainbow coloured dress from 1927 with its loose straight fit 
below the knee length and drop waist, this dress would have been right on trend in the 1920s. Next we have Utility Scheme Brown Suede Tab Shoes, which date between 1942 and 1947. Designed to be practical and sturdy, these shoes are part of the 1941 Utility Scheme. This ration clothing scheme allowed people to buy good quality clothing for a reasonable price, but I think they would have also been brilliant for dancing. And finally we have a pair of double wing earrings by Malcolm Appleby who opened his first workshop in Crathis in 1969. These earrings are from 1993 and they're platinum and gold. The wing forms of these earrings demonstrate Appleby's preoccupation with representing feathered creatures. The illusion of feathers is heightened by the fine hand graving on both sides, which adds to the realistic texture. Here we have a silk and velvet Gordon tartan dress from 1854, which was made for and worn by Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert championed the wearing of tartan in their own and their children's clothes, and they helped to make tartan fashionable in the 19th century. This dress is strikingly Scottish, warm and practical for the chilly Scottish weather, and incredibly tiny, as was Queen Victoria. Prince Albert is also said to have designed the Balmoral tartan. It's not featured in this dress, but is worn by many monarchs since, to reflect the colours found in the Aberdeenshire granite, with its distinctive grey, black and red plaid. And of course, to go with the tartan, there has to be a bit of bling. And here we have a kilt pin, made in 1900 by Aberdonian company Alexander and John Smith & Co., this silver kilt pin has an oval cut amethyst set above an open work twisted stem. Beside it we have a granite brooch made by George Jameson in 1850. It is made of red and grey granite set in a silver mount with a pale cairngorm stone mounted in the centre. The brooch fastens with a single pin fastener and a loop which allows it to be worn as a pendant. The brooch is an example of Scottish style jewellery that was popular during Queen Victoria's reign when there was a trend for Highland souvenirs. George Jameson was the son of a silversmith and he took part in the 1862 International Exhibition. He concentrated on Scottish inspired pieces such as granite brooches and decorative objects, building on the popular interest in the Highlands that had been encouraged by the royal family. He had a partnership with his son, forming the company George Jameson and & Son, and since 1867 the firm had been active at 107 Union Street in Aberdeen. In 1881, William White Carey entered into the partnership, giving us the famous shop Jameson & Carey. And finally, here we see a stunning oil painting of Queen Victoria on her throne painted by Herbert Luther Smith in 1848. This is an impressive painting at nearly nine feet tall and it is displayed alongside by the same size portrait of her husband, Prince Albert. And there they stay side by side in Gallery 9 in Aberdeen Art Gallery. I hope you enjoyed our train journey up Royal Deeside today. And now we're settled in the pub with the fire on, a fiddler playing and our drams are poured. And we can think about all the objects and artworks we saw along our journey. Perhaps you have a favourite object from the collection that you saw today. You could tell us on social media or you can get in touch with us via our website.